Oh, Rachel, tell me, why are you running? Well, it's a little bit of a long story. Uh, four years ago, my special needs son was told he needed a mask for speech therapy. And that is when I realized that government overreach was intruding upon my ability to meet my son's needs and it was negatively impacting the autism community. I do national work advocating uh, for special needs children and for the autism community. And instead of getting mad, I decided this was time for me to get involved. And four years ago, I began doing volunteering for multiple organizations, working to protect parental rights, individual liberties, medical freedom, informed consent, uh, because how I saw how negatively impacted the special needs community was. Eventually, that resulted in me being hired as a legislative aide for the Michigan House of Representatives. And I have been serving there um, just since this past term. I began oh, about a year and a half ago. And I've spent the last two years watching a lot of laws pass that, from what I can see, violate the Constitution. I see some very serious issues with bills being passed that potentially violate uh, civil rights protections of religious freedom. I have seen laws passed that attack gun owners, um, individual liberty, parental rights, and I see bills on the horizon that I'm very concerned about that are looking to target the homeschooling community. And when I started learning more about what our county commissioners did, I realized how much impact our county commissioners have on the day-to-day -day lives in our community. And I have loved working in Lansing as a constituent relations legislative aide. I'm the bridge between government agencies and people. And when government fails, it's my job to get people what they need. So I'm the go-between between government and people. When I saw the importance of what the county does and how they affect those day-to-day -day lives, I realized all my work in Lansing was not going to have a direct impact on my ability to protect my own community or to serve them. Currently, I'm serving constituents of Oakland County, which I love. But when I realized how much I loved advocating for people in between people and government agencies, I decided I want to do this for my own family. I want to do this for my own community at the county commissioner level. And something that I have noticed in my work with the special needs community is that there is a need in Ottawa County that has not been met and that is special needs resources for adults with special needs. So our school system does a great job of providing and caring for our special needs children up to a certain age. Around the age of 26, we have a real lack of services. And as I have learned from uh, friends in the autism community or other people with special needs adults that live here in Ottawa County that I know, they have told me that they have to go to Kent County to get what they need for their special needs child once they are at that adult age. I am able to make a direct impact on advocating for the special needs community right here in Ottawa County by becoming a county commissioner and advocating for expanding our resources for the special needs community at the adult level. And I'm not looking to reinvent the wheel. I wanna look at what Kent County is doing really well and replicate that for Ottawa County so that our special needs community can receive better services. And I wanna take the skills that I've learned in Lansing, advocating between people and government agencies to do the exact same thing here for Ottawa because government can offer valuable services but they're often inaccessible or inefficient or people simply don't know what's available to them. I wanna be able to make the services of Ottawa County more accessible, um, if there are ways that we can save money and run things more efficiently, I would love to get my hands into that so that I can help people access services that are offered by the county. And I'm very interested in keeping government in its lane. Because of what I went through with my son, I saw what happens when government steps out of where it belongs. As a county commissioner, a part of my job is upholding the Constitution, and that means protecting the individual liberties, parental rights, and medical freedom of all of my constituents. In that role, I will not only be able to help people access our resources in Ottawa County, potentially advocate for our special needs community, 
but I will be able to ensure that our health department is not misused by the administration to violate the Americans with Disabilities Act or the individual liberties and freedoms that are protected by the Constitution. So the short version is government overreach affected my son deeply four years ago. As a result, I got involved in all of the organizations that I work for and now I want to bring my experience to serve my own family and for other families to provide for the special needs community in better ways, to serve people, but to make sure that our government stays in its lane and does what it's supposed to do and help it to do well. You pretty much probably answered this next question and put in that answer. Uh, what are your priorities? Oh, well, priority number one is upholding my oath of office. I take that very seriously. My oath is to the Constitution. It is not to mandates or Michigan codified laws. That also means when I'm looking into grants or things that come into the county, we need to look at it through that lens to make sure that we're not violating our oath. Um, my next priority is, again, I'm interested in looking at how we can improve our services for the special needs communities with adults. Um, as I get into office and can learn more about how the budget is allocated, I'm very interested in looking into what services we're providing and if they're really being used. I know there's uh, the hot topic is Ottawa Foods. I'm confused as to why my church provides more meals effectively than our Ottawa Foods program. Now, because of the experience I have at the state, I would really love to see if there's a way that we can make that system more accessible. I have a feeling we could be serving far more people with it if we made it a little bit easier to use. From what I understand, it's done with a voucher system, and that, that voucher system may be creating some barriers for people. So I would like to see if there's areas where we can remove barriers to give people easier access to underutilized services at the county level that already exist. Tell me about you personally. You've pretty much told me about your son. So like, like things you like to do, places that you go, you can talk about your son again, but like, tell me about you personally. Well, man, I love freedom. <laughs> Uh, some of the favorite things I love to do with my kids are just getting outside and getting active. Um, I lost my mom a year ago this coming weekend and when I lost her I felt like I lost a part of myself and I wanted to make sure that self-care became a priority and about a year ago I got really into health and fitness so one of my favorite things to do is, is cook and I do a lot of organic cooking from scratch and so making food that is healthy, that's whole foods, um, and also um, exercising has become my, one of my favorite things to do. I do it with my kids. Um, and so right now I am taking a break from my typical cooking and workout routine because door knocking is dominating my life. Um, but my hobbies are really learning about nutrition, trying new foods, and trying to get my kids to eat more vegetables by hiding it in things. <laughs> But getting outside um, in the summer, this is my favorite time of year. Going swimming with my kids, going to my dad's cottage. Um, I love to water ski. I do a lot of running, kickboxing, Tabata. I love moving and I love eating. And so as it works out, most of the time one is required to do the other. So I have a passion for food, nutrition, exercise, and just playing with my kids. Why should people vote for you? Well, what makes me a little different in this race is that my experience is much more geared towards the current culture war that we're facing. On all of my lit that I give out at doors, it says boys are boys and girls are girls. People who say science is real seem to have forgotten biology. And because I am raising kids in a culture that is attacking identity, a lot of my work in volunteering has been around advocating for childhood innocence. So I spend a lot of time uh, working in that arena and, and protecting my kids. Can you repeat the question again? I actually lost my train of thought. Why should people vote for you? Yes, thank you. Um, my experience is current. The reason that people need to vote for me is because where was my opponent in 2020? What we're currently facing is government overreach. 
We're living in an age where we're fighting the culture to keep our ch children innocent. Children are not racist or sexual. But I also want to keep my family free. My career and my experience is very much dedicated to defending the childhood innocence of the current things going on in culture, but also to defend us from government overreach. More of my experience stems in the current struggles that our families are facing, that are raising kids. Millennials are concerned about whether or not they'll be able to afford their future and if they're going to be able to raise children in this culture where childhood innocence seems to be lost. I want to protect my kids and others from what I consider to be very mature adult content. My son is a white male and currently diversity, equity, and inclusion seems to be a battle in our culture. But DEI proclaims that white males are automatically oppressors. I want to make sure that my son isn't labeled a certain way because of the color of his skin or because he's male. So the, the experience that I possess is going to be more applicable to the struggles that our families will be facing over the next four years. Tell me a little bit about um these past year and a half, two years, how, how have you seen the Ottawa County government uh, being run? Like, what, what has your, been your thoughts about that? Okay, well, I will note that I am running for an open seat and I'm not an incumbent. And while I've been working for the state level, I have attended some of those commissioners meetings and I have tried to follow those. From what I can gather, I think our commissioners are new and they're learning and they're fine tuning how they're running the county. And I think from day one, they did exactly what they promised that they would do. They defunded DEI and they've been under attack ever since. It's interesting to see how when I door knock, I have to educate people about what our commissioners have and haven't done by fighting what your news stations publish. It's very interesting to see how the media has twisted and attacked these commissioners for their conservative values, uh, villainized for the way they have hired and fired without providing full transparency. My overall opinion is that I support our current commissioner board and the decisions that they've made. And yet tens of thousands of dollars have poured into my district to promote a mailer claiming that the current commissioners have had $42 million in new spending since 2022. They took office in 2023. And the 2022 board had $33 million in new spending in just that one year alone. So my opinion on the board has been based on what I've seen in the meetings, but not what I've seen in the media. And I've had to educate my voters as I go about what's truth and what's fiction. So overall, I support the board. And I think that there were decisions that they could have uh, made a little differently. I think there are the way things are done matter. I don't argue with the decisions that they've made, but I think that we could fine tune the methods. So I agree with the decisions. In some cases, I think the methods could be improved. And I think experience as we go along is going to really lend itself to improving that whole process. Perfect. All right, cool. Uh, now I would like to kind of, like I said, follow up to get some kind of clarity on some questions. So obviously mental health is a big, um, mental health uh, is a big topic of discussion for you, obviously with, with what's going on with your son. Mm -hmm. um, there are obviously is a CMH board. Have you ever thought about going to that board as well? Oh, that actually only recently came out of my radar that I found out that um, I believe the head of CMH um, is, is leaving mm -hmm. or has left. They have an interim right now. Yeah, and, um, and then I found out how large the budget was and, and to be honest, I had not looked into how much goes into CMH. Um, and as I've been door knocking, people have been expressing to me their own concerns about the lack of resources for that. And I know we're very short on psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, I would love to be more involved with learning more about what CMH does and how we can support them because mental health has become a huge issue for many families. Post-COVID, I know there's a lot of kids and teenagers and even adults um, that are still dealing with the repercussions of living through a pandemic. 
of, of having to watch incessant news stories declaring cases, cases, cases. Um, that does something to people. People have lived through probably the biggest PSYOP of our lifetime, run by your news, and they need help. I'm a former social worker, and I have seen at the doors what COVID has done, and it's divided people. It's caused higher rates of depression and suicide, and CMH is gonna be more important than ever. And I would love to get more involved with CMH and to educate myself about what they do and how they do it and how we can support them. So would you like to see more funding go towards them? I'd have to look at what their funding goes towards now before I could give an opinion on funding. Um, I can see that they definitely need help, but from what I understood, I spoke with uh, Rebecca Curran, who is our incumbent that is endorsing me for her seat. Um, and she told me that they have ARPA funding to be able to hire the psychologists. They are just not finding the people. So some of the issues they're coming up against are hiring the right people. I don't know if it's a funding issue or if it's just a gap in finding the right professionals to be able to come and serve. Uh, you mentioned making services more accessible. What services were you trying to make more accessible? Or, um... Oh, the one in particular that, that I, I've looked at is, is Ottawa Foods. Okay. Because um, as, as a former social worker and a very strong Christian, um, I think that meeting people's basic needs is a priority because when people's basic needs are not met, they can thrive. If people are in fight or flight mode, whether it's for uh, hunger issues, maybe it's mental health issues, people don't operate well. People are gonna thrive when their immediate needs are met. And so those are the services I'm most interested in looking at to make sure that are available for people is meeting those immediate needs, whether it be physical or mental, that's going to create a better outcome for everybody when they can be in a mental place and a physical place where their needs are being met. So are, would you want to see that position get reinstated? I, I remember you mentioned your church, you, your church did a better job. Mm -hmm. So explain to me, I, to weigh out that answer and that answer from earlier, can you explain the, yes. what you're trying to better convey here? Well, I, through our church, um, we partner with a group called Hand to Hand. Okay. Um, and there are multiple charities that partner with churches and schools and the community donates everything that they need and then they will put together meals that get brought to homes or packed in backpacks to be able to go home. Um, there's another one called, uh, I believe it's uh, Children's Food Basket. Uh, and those organizations do a phenomenal job and everything's donated. Um, I'm not against Ottawa Foods providing food that is paid for by, you know, by funding. But it's done with a voucher system, whereas hand-to-hand. So -hand. You're talking about Senior Project Fresh, the vouchers? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking at how the churches do it, and I'm wondering if I'm trying to learn how Ottawa Foods actually works and what part of it wasn't working what part was, I love the idea of, again, helping meet people's needs, but doing it efficiently and making sure that it's easy, easily accessible. And uh, there's some question on whether or not, and, and I've heard this from people, is that something that the county should offer or is that the responsibility of the church to meet, meet in the community? Well, first I would like to see, is that need being met? by the churches alone or do we need additional resources because i think that the basic needs of of people need to help be met uh, by government to bridge that gap if the church isn't serving but our church serves so many meals and it's just through the generosity of our congregation and people getting involved ottawa foods obviously is is going to be funded so I would support having Ottawa Foods be a part of our county programming, but only if it can be done well and on an appropriate budget and be effective in the way that it's serving. If the program is costing more money than the output of its service, it, it doesn't financially make sense. But there's, there's always room for improvement. I'd like to look at that. I would like to see if that program could have a great place in Ottawa and run better on less money.
because meeting needs for those basic needs, like like I said, food and mental health are very important to me. So those are those are some of the priorities that um, that I have as a former social worker, as a mom, um, well, and as a Christian. Um, you you were telling me you're upholding you were really up for upholding the Constitution. Obviously, we have this discussion nowadays where it's a federal constitution and a state constitution because now Roe v. Wade versus the federal government has mm -hmm. been overturned. But here in uh, Michigan, we have Proposal Three. Yes. So, what goes to your mind when you say you're much firm on the Constitution? Well, that's more in reference to the health department and mandates. Okay. Now, as a commissioner. I have absolutely no sway on whether or not abortion is legal. It is. It's legal and available. And in my opinion, you can't legislate morality. And I don't think that I am going to save a single life from completely banning abortion in the state of Michigan. Women will go elsewhere to get that. This is a heart issue. And in the church, we change hearts with ministry and by offering resources. That's why I support the Pregnancy Resource Center. So upholding my oath of office will mean that I make sure that no tax dollars go towards any abortion services. I have absolutely no say in whether it's legal, but I believe it violates individual liberties and freedom of religion to allow someone's taxpayer dollars to pay for something that would go against their deeply held religious beliefs. So, I see as paying for an abortion something that shouldn't be done by taxpayer dollars because it would violate the religious beliefs of those, including myself, um, that do not support abortion. So that's going to be a religious belief issue, but as a commissioner, I have no authority on whether or not it's legal. But it would, in my, my feelings about the Constitution, will impact how I advocate for tax dollars to be used. But individual liberties and freedom, that is what was infringed upon when the health department shut down schools, when there were mask mandates, and then when there were coercion measures in order to get vaccinated. That is what I'm more concerned about may happen again. I don't know if our health department will ever be used by the Whitmer administration or whatever next administration is um, to tell people to mask up or to be treated with something. Every person is unique, and in the autism community, nothing is one size fits all, especially medically. These children have major medical issues that vary. In fact, some of them have severe sensitivities to food dyes or polysorbate 80. Some of them cannot be safely vaccinated. There's simply nothing that is one size fits all for that community, and I'm more interested in protecting our individual liberties and freedoms when it comes to that area. I will uphold the Constitution as a whole, but when I say I'm pro-individual liberty and pro-Constitution, in the back of my mind, I am thinking back to 2020 when our bodily autonomy was violated by mandates that were coming down from the state. Cool. Thank you. Um, you mentioned culture war. You, when you're door knocking, you go, boys are boys. So explain to me a little bit about what, when you go out campaigning and you're doing mm -hmm. that kind of... Um, why... Why do you feel that the culture war has needed to be present here in the, the local level of like, this kind of topics? Um, because many people are involved in school boards. School board races are becoming a big deal. And that is because parents such as myself have discovered some really mature sexual content in our libraries. And when we question it, we get called book burners. They're saying, you want to ban books. We're realizing there are books in our schools and in our libraries that are being made available to minors without parental consent that have extreme graphic sexual pictures, depictions of uh, rape, depictions of incest, instructions on how to use um, anal beads. I don't think any child needs that information, but if a parent wants to present it to them, they absolutely can. So when I say culture war, it's because I'm concerned that there is a push to hypersexualize our children, to even tell them, and there's, I've, I've seen a book, it's a board book for kindergartners that we found, that says when you're born, the doctor guesses at if you're a boy or a girl, 
And sometimes the doctor is wrong, but when you get older, you'll figure it out. That is incredibly damaging to present to a toddler in a board book. The fact that your gender is a guess. I believe that you are born male or female and that there are very rare cases where genetically someone is born with a severe issue. Now it's becoming a trend that is pushed in our schools. Why do we have teenagers that are suddenly developing gender dysphoria? Gender dysphoria develops typically around the ages of four or five. It's persistent, it's consistent, and it's insistent and diagnosable. This is not a mood swing that you have when you're 16. I am not sure why it's somehow a cultural trend to push girls into thinking that they might be boys. And it's also become a trend in our schools to allow children to identify as animals. I was going to school board meetings with our friends, having to give public comment about how it was inappropriate for teenagers to be in our schools dressed up as a cat or a dog and identifying as an animal. Has or, that happened here locally? Yes. Okay. Yes, and last year, our school board had to create a new dress code policy that children could not show up to school as a dog or a cat to address this problem of furries in our school. There is a very real culture war going on for our kids in telling them that their identity can change, that it's fluid, and it's whatever their mood is. That is very damaging psychologically to a child to be told that their identity is not grounded or rooted in who they were born as in the image of God. They are communicating to our kids through books, through Disney shows. I can't let my kids watch any streaming shows because in children's shows, a boy character may transition to become a girl character midway through a season. We have children's shows that are also depicting romantic relationships between a young girl and a boy, and then later on she decides, oh, now I'm attracted to girls. These are all very mature sexual information that is left up to parents. Sex ed has to be opted into in school. Parents can decide to opt out, and yet in our schools they're providing sex ed related materials about gender identity without parental consent. These are current issues that we're facing in our schools, and I would encourage anyone watching this to go to the Kent District Library and check out a book called Let's Talk About It. A book that I did a Facebook Live video on, but I had to cover up a bunch of things with post-it notes, or I would have been banned off of the platform for showing porn. And if I offered that book in a public place to a child, I could be charged with sexual assault for providing pornographic content to a child. And yet these books are available just five miles away from here in Granville at the Kent District Library for any kid to come up and find. We are in a very real culture war and it's over our kids. Now, I usually don't have these discussions at doors, but I have had people ask me about it who see girls are girls or boys are boys. And they say, thank you, it's common sense. So what do you tell uh, families who might identify as LGBTQ plus? Well, I'm happy that they are, have found an identity that, that they want, but they can keep that to themselves. I would prefer that families that have that not be pursuing other families. I make different decisions for my kids and I go to church. It would be wrong of me to attempt to coerce a family into my lifestyle or my decisions. I'm very supportive of parental rights. And if there is a family that has a child that's struggling with that, they can go and they can check out books. They can have that discussion with their child, but it shouldn't be done in a way that exposes another child to something that could be a mature topic. That's up to every parent. So I really do believe in parental rights. If your child is struggling with that, that is up to you to deal with as a parent. You know your child best. But what you choose for your child should not be forced onto another one. 
You mentioned day one, uh, these commissioners did what they uh, were, uh, they did. Explain mm -hmm. to me that, what, what do you mean by day one? What, what did they do that? They, they got rid of the diversity, equity, and inclusion department. That was a huge issue. Um, they also fired uh, attorney Doug Vanessen. I had my own dealings with Vanessen when my son was removed from his school because there was a case of chicken pox. And at the time, my son was receiving multiple services um, from the school for speech and occupational therapy. And he was being denied free and appropriate education because he hadn't received a chicken pox vaccine. Um, and then I was inappropriately advised um, by Marsha Manzare and, and given inappropriate medical advice for my family. She was way outside of her lane. And Doug Van Essen even admitted in, in some of his conversations with my attorney that while I may have had a case to get my son back in school, they basically tied me up in court until it was no longer applicable and my son would be back anyway. But I had my own issues with Doug Van Essen, but I did not trust him. And I think that the commissioners uh, needed to find legal counsel that they could trust that wouldn't work against them with getting rid of DEI. So I absolutely supported them letting go of that attorney and replacing him with, with someone of their choosing and, and defunding the DEI department. Um, and we did need, need a new administrator. Um, I agreed with them replacing the administrator. Um, in hindsight, I don't agree with the choice of John Gibbs. That did not work out. Um, but I fully supported them choosing a new administrator on that day. And when they were running, they were telling people, um, we're getting rid of DEI as soon as we get in. Um, and they did. And I think that racism is an issue, but that DEI isn't the way to solve it. I don't think that labeling one group oppressed and another one an oppressor or declaring that equal outcome is mandatory. The equity in diversity, equity and inclusion means creating equal outcomes, not equal opportunity. I am for equal opportunity and the outcome isn't always going to be the same. DEI declares that if you don't have an equal outcome, it's because racism and it's always because racism. I think there can be different outcomes for other reasons and it's not always racism. So on day one, when they got rid of that diversity, equity and inclusion department, that was one of the things that they did that they made good on for our campaign promise. The reason why I bring that up is I, I, a lot of people shared this video with me a long time ago. Um, you posted about how the health department director should get her um, resume ready. Uh, we already know who's going to be the new health director um, way before day one. So what was that about? Oh, well, to be honest, <laughs> We really had no idea what was coming, but we were hopeful. And we knew the existing health department director had gone along with all of those mandates, all of those mandates, all of the ones that we knew violated our rights. However, um, that health department director that I was referring to in the video that you're mentioning, well, we knew that on day one, they would be challenging her for her job because of the actions that she took along with the health department. However, she resigned. She, she left. They didn't fire her. She was gone. Um, and, and then we had a whole different scenario. Uh, so in that case, yeah, I, I was hoping that if she had a job, they would replace her with somebody better, but uh, it didn't work out that way. But she ended up leaving on her own accord. But didn't you comment that you know who's going to be next? <laughs> to be honest, I suspected, I suspected Nate Kelly only because I know him personally and because um, Ryan Kelly was running for governor. Um, Ryan Kelly had expressed that if elected, he would consider Nate to be director of MDHHS. In my mind, I was hoping that Nate, if he was qualified enough to be director of MDHHS, would apply and be considered for that job. At that point, no applications had happened, but I know Nate Kelly personally, and I knew that if the uh, our health department director left, I was personally going to encourage him to apply because I think he was very well qualified. But to be honest, nope, we didn't know. We were hopeful. 
Perfect. That, that answers the one burning question I've always had. Um, oh, yes. Nope. That was, that was more of a, um, we're hopeful, we see a potential trajectory, and, and I knew that if he had the opportunity that he would apply for that position. Perfect. I, I've taken up enough of your time. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, anything I missed you want to further discuss about? I want to know about that 60% raise story that you wrote. Well, I'm doing the interview. You're not interviewing me. Well, as I'm knocking doors, I'm really surprised at how many people think they cannot vote for me because of hit pieces you've written on our former board. I think it's a form of election interference and it's affecting my ability to campaign. And I just want you to know that we're watching and what you do matters. I appreciate that you're elevating the voice of, of people that are running for office. But if you do your job well, informed people make the best decisions. And that is what informed consent is. So I believe in informed voter consent. And I would urge you to do your job well, because what you're doing right now is a very, very good thing. But that story that was an absolute lie that our commissioners had given themselves a 60% raise is still impacting my race today, a primary. The wrong information blasted out on media can cause mental health problems, it can change elections, and have serious repercussions. So for anybody watching this, I would just urge you to do your homework and, and know who you're voting for, because an informed voter is the best one. And if I'm not your candidate, that's okay. I want you to choose what is the candidate that has the values that you want. Do your research. Don't show up to the polls and be surprised by who's on your ballot. I want everyone to make informed choices because informed choices are always the best ones.